for joining us, Minister, for this very special feature that we are focusing on strong women in our country. And, you know, we want to move beyond the politics. What kind of a child were you, you know, in your early days? Um, were you shy? Were you very outspoken? I know you've once said that you were bullied at school. And I'm, a, I'm a very shy person even now, and hope knows it takes a lot for me to even go into interviews to see myself on, on TV. And I think it's also this very hard upbringing that the self-esteem gets lowered when I was beginning to reflect to say what makes me have such... Because part of being shy is also low self-esteem about yourself. So I'm, I've always grown up a very a shy child, but also because of my lisping. So when you speak, it will uh, tease you about the fact that you can pronounce it in words properly. That also forces you not to speak a lot. I refuse to be bullied as a child. So when somebody takes my pen, then I fight back. And I just realized that it still remains in me even now in politics. I just refuse to be bullied, even in, 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 in political structures. I, I, don't bully anybody, I don't manipulate anybody, and I refuse to be manipulated. Tell us about the relationship with your siblings growing up in Soweto. Tell us more about your childhood. You know, we had a very, I would say, difficult mother. Strict to the extremes, and that forced us to be close to each other because we had to be each other's keeper. Her policy was that you can't sit during the day, you must be doing something. We were not allowed to sit and not do anything. So we had a gate, a, 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 a steel gate, and then we'll put a stone so that it gives us a warning that she's coming in, then we jump and do something. <laughs> she, she's a very temperamental, but she started throwing her, 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 her crockery, and that was the best. And that's because she really felt completely <laughs> under siege. And we would run and go and call my father because we really found her to be this very difficult one. That's why my sister says, half the time, I just, when I see a person being nice to me, I said, I think she's going to reveal herself that she's my mother. Not this one. This one's just too straight for me. With hindsight, I just think that was the only way uh, in the townships we grew up. I look around. I can't find any, very few families managed to raise their children without too much interference from the environment. They had early childhood, early teenage pregnancies, it was arrived, dropped out at school. Tell me about your, your father. I know that you once also said that, you know, you think that you were his favorite. He was killed whilst I was in detention. And I arrived on his funeral because they didn't even tell me that they're taking me to his funeral. They just they came to my cell to say, you're going home. And I thought I was being released. I was quite happy. When we arrived at the gate, it's my father's funeral. And I'm meeting the heads at the gate. And they had to take him back for me to see him for the last time. And after his funeral, I was taken back to prison. And it really still pains me because he really loved me. and was quite sad that I didn't, I didn't even see him. It's so difficult to deal with the pain. It just doesn't go. doesn't go. It doesn't go away. When I was looking at the pictures, I saw a picture of me with him. And the, the emotions came again. I just feel that I wish I had been able to say certain things to him. Just take me through your album. <laughs> Show me a bit, um, you know, of... of me. Yeah, oh. it's when I was at university. I think it's my first day at Teflon. Oh, wow. <laughs> My goodness! <laughs> and sources also told me that you were an athlete. I am. I, I was. That's why this picture was. It was my athletics team. I was an athletics oh, wow. teacher. So uh, this is when I was at Maria. This, is this I was playing netball. Oh. <laughs> I used to play netball with Ria. She was our oh, shooter. Ria. Ria. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know who this one is? Uh, Oh, that's lovely. This one. Oh, yeah, that's a Sydney Pointer. Sydney Pointer. Yeah. I always tell my kids about this. You know, when we were teachers, there was nothing we could take our kids out to, so I had to take them to the airport as an outing. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you think that your childhood played a role I in think you are today? To a very large extent, I must say. Extremely, extremely so. You know, I mean, the mere fact that we're never allowed to sit down at home, I think has enabled me to have the energy to, to do all the things that I'm supposed to do. I've always strived, strived to do them well. This thing of saying you'll only rest when you sleep. So even now, I find myself, I, was, I find myself unable to, to relax. My grandmother always used things and tales, and there are times when it's difficult to take a decision in the position I am. And I remember my grandmother, every time you were hesitant to do something, she would say, hey, my child, you know the donkey never arrived at the market. So she used to tell me about this story about the, the donkey which drowned because everybody kept on advising. So even I sit here and then have to really take a decision and say, hey, you know, this donkey is going to die on the way. So I have to carry it. If it falls, it falls. So, so it's also the idiom, I think, the soft part, the idiom that my, 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 my grandmother raised us with helps me sometimes to stand up even when I feel it. It's scary. Uh, if I take this decision, it's going to happen. There's going to be a, a backlash. But I just say, hey, this donkey has to arrive at the market, whatever the circumstances are. We know that lately in the news, Kibi Mopatswe and Ayana Dlodlo recently made comments about the fact that South Africans don't really know what happened in the underground, um, in the, uh, those underground meetings and structures. Um, you know, um, so bad people were killed, some were raped. I mean, do we actually know what really happened there? Is there stories still to be told? There are lots of stories which we tell about the stupid things we did, how we would, especially even in Tana, because it was quite scary. When I think about it and all the things that happened, I used to ask myself to say, after having come close with Mama Sela and was following you, and I managed to escape through the kitchen of your Kentucky and because we were waiting for the lift to pick us up there. So I decided that I let me go and buy some food. Then I could see him at the mirror and he was following. I mean, he was a killer master. And I just felt that, yeah, this one is waiting outside. I said to these kids at the tellers to say, I have to go in now and I have to go that other side. Somebody might kidnap me anytime. And fortunately, Everybody understood, even the workers to say, sneak this other way, there's an exit this way. You run as much as going to be dark when he, he and go this direction, just out of, so there will be those, moments. but what he said after escaping, because we're not even cell phones, I hacked to Devon to the conference. And so there will be those moments where you just felt that, oh my God. And it was just a narrow escape. We went to KZN with the NECC, then we, our car was bombed, we were chased, we had to come through chimneys. And you, 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 and everything was bent there. But you proceeded to go to the conference when we knew that we have been spotted, they're looking after us. Because we just felt that if somebody can stay in prison for 20 years, there is no way you can sit outside and say it's right not to do anything. We know that you, you had breast cancer, right? Mm -hmm. In a time when it was very difficult with the textbook saga. Something that nobody really knows about you. Um, and to that extent that you, you said once that you kind of started planning your funeral. When I had breast cancer, I just... It made, it made me actually laugh because I've, I'm this person who likes helping people if they're sick. I just want to empathize and see what I can help. And then it says to me, my goodness me, now it's, it's my turn. Uh, I always ask people to be strong. It's my turn to be strong. Uh, let, me sort, let me not have self-pity. Let me sort myself out. I have a child who's a minor at school. I, or my mother was old. And... Let me not waste time just pitying myself. Let me do what I have to do now. You know, in Sutu they say sickness reports death. And I said I was quite, I'm quite lucky that my death is being reported to me. Let me just face it if it's coming. Let me face it. Let me sort myself out. Let me not have self pity. Let me not fight. In any case, I'm going that way. Let, let, I'm going to work up to the end. I told the president to say I've just been diagnosed with cancer. 
I'm on treatment and I might at some stage ask you to release me because I really don't, also don't want to be put into the state. So I, I really confronted it and just say, I used to say to people, be strong. It's my time now to hear my voice. Uh, let me be strong and do what I have to do. And what I have to do is to prepare for my death. 